Is this loud enough? I've been asked to speak up. I... Good. This, this is quite interesting. Um, lecturing in higher education has become very uh, audio-visually aided. This is like old school, just talk. Um, at least I've got a microphone. I um, Thank you for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. The, the issue is close to my heart in a number of ways. Uh, as has been said, I've been a a non-obsessed member of the RSPB. What, what that means to me is that I'm not one of these characters who goes around with half a ton of equipment on their back, all the latest um, tele telescopes and binoculars. Um, I go for a walk, and if a bird flies past, that's okay. Um, they seem to, um, yeah, take enough equipment to restage the Normandy landing sometimes. <laughs> I called this um, talk, Bang Goes the Countryside, in, in two senses. One is, one is increasingly concerned, not least today, as I looked at the Observer, about the new plans for uh, limiting planning controls in, in greenbelt areas and the countryside more generally to build yet more and more houses on floodplains. Um, but also as a concern about the shooting business. I'm not an expert on the shooting business. I'm not um, devoted to uh, a relentless critique of shooting as a, as a practice, but it seems to me they have some serious uh, questions to answer about contemporary practice. So this, in a sense, is a talk that goes from criminology to cruelty. And maybe that's not so far. I started out, in, what, what, what is not necessarily clear, I, I started out on, on, a, on a gun control journey almost by accident. Uh, with some colleagues I was looking at issues of um, uh, repeat victimisation on a housing estate not far from Brighton. And as we went house to house interviewing people about their vandalism and burglary and antisocial behaviour experiences, we began to notice that quite a few doors and window frames had uh, pellet holes in them. Uh, as we proceeded, it turns out that quite a lot of people reported that their dogs and cats had been uh, shot by people with air rifles. Uh, the, ne the very next interview we did, someone had an air rifle propped up against the kitchen sink. That struck me as slightly odd. Um, and it began to emerge that some people obviously had air rifles, uh, many of them kept them for, as they disclosed to us during the interviews, for self-defense. That's a very American take on it, but I, I looked further and, and it seemed that this was a practice. We, we interviewed uh, one householder who said, um, I've talked about this in the book, um, he, had a, he had a shotgun and two rifles back there, and if anyone broke in, they could have some of that. And, and it pointed to a picture of if people are permitted to keep weapons at home, and if people are fairly cavalier about how they, how they used those or secured them, uh, particularly with children around, then you could expect widespread misuse of of those weapons, and, and lo and behold, that's exactly what you find. There is widespread misuse of air weapons. It's one of the commonest forms of gun crime today. Lots of wild animals and domestic animals are shot uh, and, and, and injured, sometimes killed, by people's random misuse of air weapons. Uh, following, of all things, Dunblane, where the issue was rather different, but it was it was the gun crime incident that put firearms firmly on the map of the government, a select committee referred to the casual cruelty associated with widespread firearm ownership, uh, unsupervised firearm ownership. And, and the, it, that same story is true the world over. Where there is uh, prevalent ownership of firearms, there will be prevalent misuse of firearms. It, it, the two follow like not it follows day. And that's become increasingly clear that that's the case in relation to, to shotguns. Shotguns are prevalent uh, and they're frequently misused. One of the, one of the campaign themes that colleagues uh, in the Gun Control Network have been trying to press government to take seriously is that Gun crime is not the sole preserve of young men on uh, inner urban housing estates. 
gun crime, if you add up the figures carefully, then something like 60% of what is recorded as gun crime occurs uh, as a result of misuse of licensed or not illegal, and I say licensed or not illegal weapons. Not illegal because air weapons are not illegal, and that accounts by itself for around 45 to 50% of what I've already, or, or, already referred to as, as, as um, gun crime, and shotguns account for much of the rest. Um, and there's a real lack of knowledge amongst the public about guns out there. It is seen as a problem entirely, almost entirely through the lens of crime. Who knew, for instance, until Hungerford in 1986, that private citizens could own AK-47 assault rifles? Who knew? Um, now they can't, um, but it points to the, the need to expose shooting uh, to the light of day. There is an awful lot of licensed firearm misuse, starting with Hungerford, Dunblane, Cumbria in 2010, Horden County Durham last, uh, last Christmas, where a, a taxi driver uh, killed three members of his own family uh, with, a, with a, a shotgun that he was licensed to own. The police had, the police had previously investigated him following allegations of domestic violence, considered that there was nothing absolutely cruel and giving him the guns back, and then he went on to, to kill members of his own family. In Oswestry, Street, a successful businessman whose business turned out not to be quite so successful, killed all the members of his own family, his dogs and horses, then himself, having set his whole house on fire. In London, we had the Mark Saunders case. Mark Saunders is the barrister who had a history of depression and alcoholism, um, and eventually had a breakdown, started firing his licensed shotgun out of the window of his block of flats. Subsequently, the police arrived, and, and he was shot by police officers in a, in a major, following a major armed standoff. There is quite a lot of firearm misuse by persons who are licensed to own, own these weapons. One of the issues that came up at a recent select committee that I gave some evidence to uh, was precisely the need for some better checks on the mental capacity and the prior record of license applicants. Do they have histories of alcoholism? Are there mental health issues uh, in, in, their, in their background? In England and Wales, in the nine years between 96 and 2005, there were 203 homicides followed by suicides committed with firearms. 39 of these were what are known as family annihilations, where the, the, the man, it's nearly always the man, kills all the other members of his family than himself. And these are almost invariably committed with firearms kept in the home, and the majority of those are licensed weapons. All sorts of issues about, as I've said, widespread misuse and casual cruelty associated with mental illness, often alcoholism, and often linked with a protracted phase of domestic violence where the, the slaughter that comes at the end of it is just the last act in a, in a, in a, in a, a history of domestic violence. Now, if you recall at the end of the uh, Dunblane and the Cullen inquiry into Dunblane, um, Lord Justice Cullen proposed that firearms not be kept by private citizens in their own homes. This, this, was, um, this was not accepted. Parliament in the end banned handguns, but relatively little was done about the ownership of rifles and shotguns. Following the incidents in Cumbria, where, um, uh, I forget his name, Bird, it was his surname, a taxi driver in Cumbria killed um, 10 people on a rampage across the, the countryside. There was a, yet another select committee to, to explore the need for further changes in, in, in gun laws. And at, at that one, I, I proposed the, the, su the suggestion that uh, if people, and it does seem to be men, if men like to keep firearms at home, 
then they ought not to be keeping large quantities of ammunition at home as well. That, that would seem to be, be, be the solution. Um, but obviously the sports shooting industry and farmers were, were not, not having that. It was far too inconvenient, they said, to, to have to, um, uh, if they were all or organise a shooting event or a competition to have to buy the, the ammunition in especially. Uh, farmers said um, it was far too inconvenient that they wouldn't be able to shoot foxes raiding the, the, the hypothetical hen house. Um, I, I mean, on, on a one radio show I said, well, we frequently have a fox in our back garden. Um, uh, he killed my son's rabbit a few years ago. Um, and all I have to do to make that fox go away is lean out of the bedroom window and clap. And, and of course, that's not good enough for a farmer. Anyway, so that, that, that's part of the backdrop of, of um, why, why the, the issue of, of, of gun ownership um, has, has, has come to kind of concern me. Um, because it seems to me to be almost inevitably associated with misuse and abuse, abuse of power, abuse of privileges. God, we're not America. We don't have a right to bear arms. Uh, I, I think we should very much see firearm ownership, should it be permitted, as, as a privilege that has to be earned, and that respect has to be achieved. And I think, there, as I said earlier, there are a number of powerful questions that, that shooting, I think, has to answer. So I was very happy when Andrew phoned uh, a few months ago and asked if I would uh, draft a comment for the Gunning for Children report. One of the concerns that the, the Gun Control Network had been uh, developing was as a result of concerns about membership, uh, the Gun Lobby, the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, what's this kind of oxymoronic um, combination of notions there? Shooting and conservation. conservation. Um, going into schools and trying to recruit more children into, into shooting. This, this didn't seem a particularly appropriate uh, strategy. So when, when Andrew said that a report was being put together looking at gunning for children, I was very, very keen to get involved and supplied a comment, the gist of which I've already uh, 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 told you about. And whilst thinking what, what it was that I could usefully say, um, and I think it was my idea. I don't think you got it from anywhere. I mean, you, you may confirm that the, the phrase that went viral was mine and not something you. I, I, I used the phrase shooting porn to describe the, uh, the magazines. I, there's a certain amount of um, commentary in, in, in criminology about what's called uh, law and order porn. And by, by that, the. Uh, the users of that phrase are referring to these very graphic, forensically detailed uh, crime scene investigation type series where you get to see the, 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 the corpse and the bullet wounds and the injury in, in great forensic detail. And I thought that those magazines, um, which proudly show people with a shotgun cropped over one arm and a handful of pheasants in the other dripping blood, were a kind of shooting call. And they really didn't like that. They didn't like being described as that. And, and that, that phrase seemed to, to, to do the rounds. It was in the Daily Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, the Daily Mail, um, the Daily Press, which I thought was interesting. And then there were a couple of editorials that appeared in, in a couple of shooting or field sports magazines. One of them really amused me. Um, he described, this is Scottish Field magazine, um, and the, the editor described himself as very amused at the suggestion that Scottish Field, which is, which is a very mediocre <coughs> kind of country magazine and occasionally has the odd article on shooting, they, they seem to find it very amusing that they should find themselves on the top shelf uh, of, of news agents, uh, along with other magazines. And apparently the editor um, asked his colleagues and staff and fellow shooters um, about this uh, repositioning of, of, of Scottish Field magazine on the top shelf. And they were all very much amused that, that Scottish Field would then find itself amongst as, he, as apparently his, his office staff explained to him, magazines such as Big Jugs, 
Asian babes, babes <laughs> and my ex-girlfriends. Um, and this amused him quite a lot. He, he, he ran an editorial that, that had a go at me as some sort of pointy-headed academic that knew nothing about the countryside and still less about his children. I had a go at the university I worked for and I didn't like that. Um, and then suggested that we would be better off banning some of the um, violent uh, video games. I, I, I took exception and, and wrote back to him suggesting that um, given the intimate knowledge that he and his colleagues had of top shelf magazines, they would, I suggested, be much more at home amongst all their favourite magazine reads, which could now be find, found in the same place. And then I added, and my wife said I shouldn't have put this in, I added, you know, I always suspected a high pro proportion of shooters were wankers. <laughs> Thank you for confirming this. Um, <coughs> And then my wife suggested I ought not to have put that in, but it, it, it did the business. And I, I will return to that very point by way of conclusion. The Field magazine also picked it up. And as I discovered, I started buying some of the gun magazines to, to look at how this campaign uh, had gone down. I, I suppose you, you also access these magazines. And I found in the November edition of... Um, the Shooting Gazette, uh, a commentary from uh, some uh, member of the Shooting Society, um, an organisation, I've never even heard of this, um, called Covert Girls, um, which, which itself is, is, has a logo of a naked woman holding a shotgun across her shoulders. So this, this top shelf uh, indication seems to, seems to run. Uh, f further and further, and, and under the on, on the website for Covert Girls, they refer to shooting as the you know the new ladies' power game, uh, handling yourself like a man. Um, there was a there was a page uh, indicating a, a, a kind of top shooting totty, uh, a whole series of men who were who were shooters, and it, it get. I digress slightly, but the point was, reading these magazines really gives you an insight into the nature and the class origins of those who persist in this kind of elite shooting. There are serious business connections, serious social connections, there's a lot of money, just the prices being charged for the shotguns. Average prices are around 5,000 quid each, but going up to 70,000 pounds for a pair of shotguns. It's, we're not talking about a sport participated in uh, by, by uh, people who are not well off. And you can also pick up a real insight into the, the ethics of the shooting business um, and the way in which shooting itself constructs and changes the landscapes in order to provide optimum uh, shooting ranges for for this slaughter of slaughter of birds, um, with us today, uh, a, a, a colleague and a, and a, and a, a fellow um, activist, who who herself lives um, adjacent to a, a, a recently constructed, relatively recently constructed shooting range. When she bought her cottage, you can you can follow this all up on on her website, Common Decency. Um, when she first bought her cottage, she was surrounded by agricultural land, which subsequently turned into a, was turned into a, 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 a commercial shooting site with large pens for pheasants, and, and every now and again, the, the shooting uh, uh, activities taking place, dead birds landing in the garden. It's 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 a real story of of a fairly cavalier uh, planning system that's allowed this to happen, you know. I've done work on, on, on the issue of antisocial behaviour, and it strikes me that if ever, if ever the label of antisocial behaviour should be applied, it's to the, to the surrounding of one's domestic home by, by gunfire and shooting and dead birds and, and all the, the, the activity associated with that. Shoot, shooting doesn't see the problem. Shooting sees itself as taking part in an activity that is as old as agriculture. 
But I think it's important also to kind of grasp the ways in which this activity has, has begun to change. It's become, it's become a, 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 an urban, uh, not an urban, a rural slaughter industry. The way that the birds are reared in large containers and then driven out of them, driven out of them into the path of guns, forced to fly over trees and obstacles in order to, 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 um, to gain height so that they make suitable targets. It, it really does strike me as there is very little in the way of sport here, and as Andrew has already indicated in his earlier talk, this is not about meeting our nutritional needs, this is casual cruelty, this is casual slaughter, uh, pointless, gratuitous, and, and done for fun. Now, the, the, the aforesaid woman that I mentioned earlier, who, 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 who's become the kind of um, poster girl of the shooting totty, uh, describes on her website um, having, recruited, having recruited a friend into shooting. Uh, and this friend has written a short blog about how she really enjoyed it, how they, how they drank champagne and laughed and had, had a lovely meal afterwards. Uh, and, and then describes how when she first went to take part in her first shoot, uh, I need to find a little piece of paper that tells me exactly what she said. When she went to take part in her first shoot, she, she commented that I, I wasn't sure how, I, how I'd feel having killed something. But in the end, you know, it didn't bother me at all. And I thought, well, it bloody well ought to. And, and this sort of sense of casual lack of concern at, at killing things, uh, and killing things that, as the Gunning, Gunning for Children campaign was trying to make clear, is something that young children are being inducted in. It struck me as utterly inappropriate and, and, and offensive. What it also showed, um, and this is an issue that, that clearly has surfaced from time to time in relation to the practices of gamekeepers, it also shows that in order to feed the kind of commercial pressures that country sports shooting uh, generate, it raises issues about what else has to be suppressed, what else has to be killed in order to maintain a thriving bird colony. So, there's, there's articles in, in, in the shooting magazines about how you have to kill other forms of wildlife, foxes, uh, rooks, other birds that might eat, that might eat the, the, the food that the pheasants are, are supposed to eat in order to make them nice plump targets. And, and one article that ended, whatever you do, keep hammering the fox population every chance you get. And the same is said in relation to wild birds, and we know that there are uh, frequent allegations of gamekeepers um, killing um, birds of prey uh, as, as part of an attempt to maintain a healthy shooting uh, population. And the more you read these magazines, the more, as I said, a, a fascinating insight can be developed into the, into the mindset and the cultural and social background and, and, and the business and political interests at stake. Um, it's clear that quite a lot of shooting and conservation initiatives are supported by government grant aid and European grant aid. In a sense, this therefore is being done in our name with our money. Um, and it's a practice clearly uh, enjoyed primarily by, by a social and cultural elite. Uh, a social and cultural elite that seem unwilling to, to, to have, as it were, the common decency to respect the, the needs and uh, interests and preferences of other, other users of the countryside. But, but we're not without opportunities here. There's another, there's, there's lately been a new uh, code of conduct issued by the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. You can see how they're, they're growing, as Andrew was indicating earlier, that there are, there, are, there are points at which we can apply pressure here. That they are concerned about the image of shooting. They are concerned about presenting the best face of shooting to the public. They, they have, I think, some guilty secrets to hide, but they also have a kind of, what, what I've always referred to, and again, mainly talking about American shooters. They have what they call a, a, an Alamo mindset. That, 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 you know, we must defend this last line, this last redoubt 
against any change, as if every, every, everything that they might lose on would become a slippery slope and, uh, and lead to eventual abolition of, 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 of uh, gun ownership in this country. And I appreciate there are many people that might want to get to that point, but, but I don't start there. And I think whatever they have that whatever they have that sense that, that there are people out to stop them ever shooting, um, they will fight every reform tooth and nail. To me, it's much more an incremental issue about uh, uh, improving shooting and, and, and working a way to, to, to prevent the grossest excesses in the first instance. So, they, they are concerned about the legitimacy of their activities, they're concerned about media attention to their activities, but you know, if ever, a, if ever a, um, a group of people were over, overdue their scrutiny by a kind of spotlight of public accountability, or even a good sociological survey, it seems to me the shooting fraternity is just that. We need to know who's doing this. We need to know where the money comes from. We need to know what they're up to. And we need to know about the, the links that, that, that tie, this, tie this relatively narrow group of people together. Um, I didn't give you the figures, but I, when I was checking before I came, the numbers of um, licensed firearm owners in this country, there are something like 140,000 uh, rifle licences uh, in this country. Um, that covers nearly 500,000 actual guns, so most, most of those licence holders have anything between one to five guns, and, and that figure's been creeping up for the past 20 years. There are around uh, just over half a million shotgun licences in this, in this country, and again that covers nearly one and a third million actual guns. That's a relatively fat, flat trend. But the, but the pressure to, to, to improve the numbers from the point of view of the shooting lobby is to get more people involved in shooting, to, 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 to build it up. And I think that's the, that's the reason for the pressure and, and the, the enthusiasm on behalf of shooting to, to get more young people in. Now, as, as if to return to, to where I started, I've always been a bit concerned about shooting, um, and sports shooting in particular, um, having a, a, a certain flag of convenience element about it. I was certainly sure that this was the case before we banned handguns. Um, it, it seemed to me that the more, the more military specification handguns that were being uh, brought into Britain prior to 1996, and the more handgun shooting sports they were inventing to find a purpose for them, were about people who, whose interest in owning guns uh, was not just about sport. I, I'm, I'm beginning to get a little concerned that that might also be an element in relation to, to um, rifles and shotguns too. There have been quite a few occasions lately when uh, householders have been confronted by burglars or, or uh, um, people have been seeing their, their vehicle being uh, tampered with and the gun owner has used the firearm that they use for sport to, to, to shoot the aggressor or the burglar or the, or the, the would-be car theft. There are quite a few, interestingly, there are quite a few articles in the gun magazines that show precisely that the law is now becoming quite lenient towards people who are victimised in their own homes. And of course, you can't have failed to notice that at the recent Tory party conference, the Justice Secretary um, is following up a continuing commitment that the Conservative Party have been giving to, to uh, uh, treat householders who shoot burglars uh, somewhat more leniently um, and, and, and not have them prosecuted. So I, I think there is a real issue about guns in the home. It, 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 it's also part of a kind of drip feed of a, a, a kind of American mindset that somehow crime in the streets is so bad we all can't sleep safely in our beds. So let's keep a, bed, uh, uh, a firearm in the in the bedroom. I took part in a survey a few 
few uh, years ago for an insurance company that produced the fascinating statistic that something like one in four British households uh, have some weapon in the bedroom which could be anything from a rolling pin to a big spoon to a, to a baseball bat or a cricket bat. And it, and it indicated that there was a certain amount of fear that people were adopting. And I think shooting has that additional element. As we become a more unequal society, as people in big houses take part in shooting events, I think they begin to think that they are entitled to keep weapons at home, not just the, to go shooting pheasants and partridges every now and again in a form of self-defense. I, I, I worry about that particular Americanization of our ideas about our rights to use, to use weapons. But I will, I will finish, I know this has been a, 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 um, a rapid approach to the, to the question. Um, I will finish with, a, with, a, with, with returning to the, to the, the, the mindset of the, this, this, this shooting fraternity, such as it is. I was amazed, as I said, you can read these shooting magazines to gain, to gain something of an insight into, into where they're at, where they're from, what they're thinking. I was amazed at the, the, the overt levels of racism and sexism implicit in, in some of the writing in these magazines. Not just a cavalier attitude to, to, to the animal kingdom, um, not just the idea that the animals are out there um, and, and, are, and are there merely to satisfy uh, their, their desire to kill things, but, but implicitly reading between the lines a lot of the times, some of the articles written carry, uh, in many respects, a, a, a very dated sense of um, <coughs> social and political proprieties. It, it's almost as if you, you've, you're reading into a kind of cultural time warp, that some of these writers really are stuck beyond a time when it was in a, not appropriate to refer to uh, uh, ethnic difference and inferiority, or, or to make gendered assertions about people and their capacities and their, their interests. What, what has struck me in reading these is, is, a, is a glimpse of a, almost a kind of an elite stuck in a 1950s time warp, and, 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 and those attitudes still prevail. I will return to, to my final point. Um, the letter I wrote to the editor of the Scottish Field, um, and, and this seemed like a, an appropriate point on which to finish. Um, I've already said what I thought of uh, quite a few members of the shooting fraternity, but I was reading an article, again, this was, I think this was in, in Shooting Times, and it described um, a shoot where uh, a number of novice shooters had um, been taken to a, to a to a, a, a property and, and they've been shooting for the first time and this guy who, who described himself as the, the head of the shoot and it, it, it sounded as if he was a fairly regular columnist for this particular magazine he, he'd instructed them all he'd made a few sexist asides about the capacities of the people in the group and finally ended the, at the end of the shoot one of the most incompetent uh, chaps on the shoot uh, had ended up having uh, shot two, two uh, rather large, plump pheasants, which, as, as, the, as the, the, the game warden uh, returned to the, to the shooting line, he, he proudly display, displayed to him. And he said he held them up in both arms, one in each hand, these two dead birds. And he was grinning. And this was my point. He was grinning like a masturbating Korean. I, I just, uh, I kind of rest my case in a sense. They are obsessed with the top shelf. It's where they belong. And I think the sooner we can get them up there and keep them up there, the better. Because this is, this is not, this is not a, 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 a perspective on modern society that I think is either palatable, acceptable, or, or really ought to have a future. Shooting, shooting has a lot of questions. We have to shine a spotlight on it, uh, and we have to expose this casual cruelty that, that, that passes in the name of sport 
and, and occasionally in the name of, of, of tradition. It's not either. It's become a business. It's driven by greed. It's driven by um, a, a, a cruel dismissal of, of the, the rights and interests of wildlife and the countryside. And I think we all have a kind of common heritage to protect in, in preventing this, this, this vision of shooting's future uh, becoming a reality. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. 